Thank you, everyone, for coming to the first uh, CHEP seminar of the semester. We're very fortunate to have Tan Dan Hammermesh visiting us today. He's the chief coordinator of the uh, IZA network, a distinguished scholar at Barnard College, and professor emeritus at the University of Texas, Austin, and the Royal Holloway University of London. He's also taught at Princeton University and at Michigan State University. Uh, his books, very well known, uh, Labor Demand, uh, Beauty Pays, Economics is Everywhere, uh, The Economics of Work and Pay, and most recently, Spending Time, which we saw together in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, when we were on a plane together, and it was in right. the, 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 a, yeah, the British Airways magazine had a feature on it, a review by some popular writer, and I thought it was really cool having this review, and they give a grade, and I looked at the grade and all the other ones, and mine was tied to the worst review that he'd given, <laughs> with Joe Stiglitz's new books. I didn't feel too bad. <laughs> He's received awards, including the Mincer Award for a Lifetime Contributions to Labor Economics, the IZA Prize in Labor, and has been a total insp inspiration for a labor economist of my generation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. What a treat, in fact, uh, coming out and getting out of the pollen in Austin, which is now absolutely severe. Uh, so my eyes are not tearing for the first time in two weeks. It's a real pleasure. Anyway, this project started off, I think, almost eight years ago uh, when Rob Krosnow and Rachel came to me and said, want to do some stuff on beauty, okay? And Rob Krosnow is now an associate dean at Texas. Uh, Rachel's a full professor at University of Illinois Chicago. They're sociologists. I have never worked with sociologists before. And, sorry, they're different from us <laughs> <laughs> you know, in various interesting ways. Uh, at that time, I wrote down a little model to think about and much of the data are based on stuff they collected for some other purposes, and I'll explain the data in great detail. But let me go over the questions first here, okay? The question is very simple. How does a kid's look affect how much they learn, what they, how they do cognitively, okay? Uh, I'll talk about the literature. You'll see why this really has not been answered before. The problems with this are one, and I get this every time I've done anything on beauty, which now goes back 30 years. How do you measure looks? Okay, we'll talk about issues in that. How do you measure cognitive development? Old, old question literature. And the final thing, which I believe is the only economics in this entire talk, okay, since I have a narrow definition of economics, is what does this imply about the returns to education? Okay. And that's an economic question. The rest is a standard evaluation, which is most of what the so-called labor field does these days. Okay. So the first question is, how do we measure beauty? And there, I think there are three different ways of doing it. The first are interviews. So I've talked to Joe. I walk into his house. And either at the very start, I can rate his looks on some prearranged scale, or at the end, I can rate it. Problem with the end, obviously, is Joe's come to the door with a suit and tie on. He looks really good. And so he gets a higher rating than really consistent with his labor market outcomes. That's a problem with that. Also, there might be a feedback from his current state to his looks, et cetera. So one should go quite a ways after the rating is done. But the interviewer with one rater, it's very, very standard. I think the first beauty paper we did, published in 94, had three different data sets using that method of evaluation. Second is photos or videos, okay? And what typically is done, and I've done this in think, three of our beauty papers, is get a photo of somebody, put it on a sheet of paper by itself always, otherwise it gets contaminated. I mean, Joe and I are on the same page, I'll get a higher rating because of the spillovers from Joe, okay? <laughs> so a separate page always, get a bunch of people to rate it on some prearranged scale, average amount, etc. Or a video, which has only been done one other time, a paper by uh, Jesse Shapiro, looking at videos of gubernatorial candidates and evaluating them and see how that helps their election, chance of election. Final method is cut the person's face from a picture into a lot of squares and evaluate basically its symmetry along various axes and slices, okay? Uh, one study very recently did that 
But rather than evaluating the symmetry, it took the face and compared it to previously valued, subjectively valued faces and said, how close does this person's face match a face that's been evaluated well or evaluated poorly? Which I think is a cut above the purely technological thing. There's more to beauty than symmetry. I mean, it's a certain je ne sais quoi. Uh, I can think of people I know who I think are good looking and objectively just measuring dimensions of the face, they wouldn't score very high. Obviously, I know people who by those former measures would do real well, but they just don't have it in some places. And you know, I, 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 I won't name names, but I do a lot of people like this, okay? So we're going to do this in various ways. We'll use two different methods among these three. Next, cognitive development, okay? I don't know, this place, your group is not too big on economics of education, I don't think. Are there people doing that here? There's some, okay. So these days, the standard thing in economics of education is to measure the value added of some intervention. This is completely standard. There are large literatures on this, as you probably know. And typically, it's a change in some objective assessment of an outcome. Test scores, usually, are this classic thing in this. And we'll do that, okay? In terms of beauty effects, there have been a large number of studies estimating wage effects of looks. Uh, I found them for eight different countries, three of them on my own, but there are a bunch of others too. UK, Australia, Germany, uh, Canada, China, US, a couple of others for sure. And what you do is people get outcomes, wages usually, or employment, uh, some evaluation of beauty, typically method number one, look at the impact, everything else the same on earnings. Okay, it's a standard. Uh, you can even do a meta-analysis and get some effect overall. And by and large, the effect is there. The best-looking people do better. The worst-looking people do worse. Uh, the effects are larger in the U.S. than in the other studies I've seen, which isn't surprising because our wage distribution is so much less equal than that elsewhere. So everything matters more here. Okay. Uh, Another study that I did with Jason Aprevea, who's department chair at Texas, was look at a bunch of countries, four countries, and ask whether beautiful people are happier. Okay. Uh, and this gets towards something that bothered me from the very first on this, namely the earnings effects were larger for men than for women, which just everybody is surprised about. Uh, there are very good economic reasons for that. It turns out the effects on happiness of beauty are the same for both sexes. Reason being, for guys, the effect on money matters a lot, but how good they feel about themselves doesn't matter so much. For women, the money effects are smaller, but just how beauty makes them feel about themselves makes them a lot happier. So the net effects are the same, but the sources of the two sets of effects are different. Main point is there's a huge amount of work now on this, making it clear that beauty matters for economic outcomes. Value-added effects. I knew nothing about this stuff before I started working on it and tried to read the literature. I finally decided that there's no way I'm going to learn it all. Try to find a survey of this, try to talk to people who are experts on it, Rick Hanashek being probably the most well-known one on this. And the best conclusion that he suggests is that teacher quality matters with a beta of about 0.1. The non-economists know what beta is. Do economists know beta? You can admit ignorance. I didn't know it. I'd forgotten what it was. I knew it uh, about 50 some years ago when I first took stats. Okay? Beta is just the SD effect of a 1SD increase. We don't do it very much in economics, but they're doing it more and more in the education literature. And I hope I didn't insult anybody. Anyway, teacher quality, beta about 0.1. Class size effects, there's a work on that. Uh, smaller effects, changing the organization of the school to charter from public, even smaller. There's a paper by Scott Carell a year, a little over a year ago, where they look at the random effect of moving a bad kid out of class. Effects are even smaller. Now, I do this because I want to compare those effects to the estimated impacts that I get of difference in looks. That's the reason for talking about this. I don't care about them per se. They're for comparison purposes. The education literature, not surprisingly, is huge. A lot of this stuff, the overwhelming majority is compare 
the teacher's prediction about how the kid will do to the teacher's perception of the kid's looks. This is not something an economist would ever do. I mean, it's subjective against subjective. I don't like that kind of stuff. And I know the sociologists wouldn't do it either. I don't want to be nasty about that. It's just... We may. <laughs> <laughs> you might, but you wouldn't get it published in a good place, I bet. Okay, there you go. Uh, I don't think that's very helpful. I found three cross-section studies that related the kid, teacher's perception of the kid's looks to the kid's actual outcome on a test. So it's cross-section only, okay? And we don't know which way the causation goes. We don't know whether, in fact, the kid did well on the test, and the kid says, ah, he must be good looking, et cetera, et cetera. So that doesn't make pass muster by us. Nobody has done what we want to do here. Take truly exogenous ratings of a kid's beauty and ask how they affect the change in the test score. In other words, hold the current period test, past period test score constant, rate the beauty in the past period, adjust for everything else, and ask how well the kid does in the next period. That's the gimmick here. That's all we're going to do. Okay? So we're going to do this on two different data sets, uh, different methods of outcome, different methods of evaluating looks, and why this happens, and what's the mechanism driving this, which is not a question we ask in economics these days. We don't ask why, we ask what. I don't know what the mechanism is. I know what it's not. I have a bunch of knots but I have no positive of what it is, as you'll see later on. And I don't know whether it's the parents who somehow push the kid, I don't think so, whether the teacher somehow spends more time, whether peers just suck up to the kid and make him or her do better, we have no idea. I have proxies for all these, but nothing much seems to explain a heck of a lot. Okay, the data set here. My guess is no economist in the room has ever heard of this data set. Have you, have you? You probably have. Okay, sociologists did this, a cute story on this, in fact. The survey of early child care and youth development, okay, started by NIH in 1991, followed kids for 11 waves till age 15. It was run by a group of people, out of, a lot out of the University of Illinois, Chicago. There was one economist on the advisory board, uh, quit after two years. He just couldn't stand the discussion. He was having no impact whatsoever. Okay? He just got angry and he quit. So economists have not been involved with this at all. I only found one paper in Econ Lit that used this data set. It's a paper by Rachel Gordon, my co-author here, who's a sociologist, but it is in Econ Lit. So this has been very ill-used. What they did was they have all kinds of questions subjective questions, and then you'll see a number of objective outcomes as well that we'll use. The kids, I'll show you, are not randomly chosen. They're chosen from 11 sites, hospitals in 10 states. Demographics are a little bit different. The beauty ratings are as follows, and this is why the study is, why our paper has gone on forever. My co-authors decided they had to have at least 10 ratings of every kid. They didn't consult me on this. There is no point ever of getting more than four. I mean, I've done these projects with four, six. One study had 12. On the one that had 12, you could take any six, and the outcome you would make no difference whatsoever. But they felt they had to get 10 ratings of everything, at least. So what we have is they have videos of each kid at each point in the study, if the kid was still in the study. They had a short slice video that chopped out five to seven seconds, took out the background, took out anybody else, and then had college students at Texas and uh, Illinois Chicago rate the looks of the kids in, a, in five seconds or less, okay? And they had large numbers of raters. They were told, uh, phooey, this is, they were told over here to rate the kid on a five-point scale very attractive or very cute. I, mean, I think the cute applies to littler kids, okay? And very attractive is for the older ones. Down to very unattractive, not cute at all, okay? And that's the distribution of ratings there, okay? Which, by the way, is a very gratifying distribution because in the ratings of adults, many more people are rated above average than below average, even in the U.S., where people are the nastiest of any place I've ever looked. 
I mean, in China, one of our studies, I think only 2% two two were rated below average. And I think the Lake Bobagon effect, about 60% were above average, which is hard to credit. Okay. Uh, in terms of the percentage of people we have of the original 1,300 plus, by the time we're down to grade age 15, we're a little below two-thirds of the original sample. But we do have videos of two-thirds at least at every point, okay? Not always the same kids, but we have a good sample at every point. Okay. Number of beauty ratings, you can see 140,000. We're getting a heck of a lot of ratings and of each kid by a lot of people at each age. Okay, assessments. We did that. They're rated above average. We took every rater's ratings at each way. So we're rating me when I'm 54 months old. And we took all the people who rated me and all the people who rated everybody else. We took your rating as a rater at that wave and we normalized your ratings for that wave. So if I'm a very nice guy in rating kids, I will cut mine down. If my variance is different, we change the variance of two. We've normalized every rating, every person, every rater within a wave and we then take the average for each kid, okay? All right. So that the average for each kid should be mean zero, right? What about the standard deviation, the cross ratings for the kid? So get your mind around this. It should be less than one. Because remember, if there's any sense about this, it should be the case that raters look at kids and say, well, yeah, that kid's good looking. And so there should be some positive correlation of ratings across raters for the same kid. So it should be the case that the SV is lower. In terms of what it looks like, this is really disturbing. This is the average rating in the left-hand columns here and the standard deviation of the ratings of girls and boys. And if you notice, at every point, the girls are rated better looking than the boys. And worse than that, okay, the difference gets larger and larger and larger. So that by the time we're at age 15, the median girl would be in the 61st percentile of boys. Okay. We'll do everything eventually separately by gender. But I found this really bothersome because in ratings of adults, the ratings average the same. The only difference is among adults, women are rated with more variance than men. In every study I've looked at, including ones I've done, women get more, uh, more than more women who are good looking, more who are bad looking, fewer in the middle. Just a fact of the beauty literature. Okay? It's also the case that there's more agreement among raters of boys' looks. Now, it's a standard deviation of the ratings for the kid at the particular age are smaller, except at the very end, for boys and for girls. I'm not doing much with the standard deviation. Main thing to note is this here. In terms of objectives, we don't have a lot. We have women, yes or no. That obviously is positive. These are just regressions of looks against a bunch of variables. What's really quite remarkable here is look at the ethnicity stuff here. Uh, the left out group here is Hispanics. The main point is that non-Hispanic blacks are rated significantly and well below the other ethnic groups. Okay? No question about that. Which again, a reason one wants to hold those things constant. What's also quite, quite neat is that the rating, the average rating, marches up with income. Those are basically income quartiles. Okay, not quite, but close enough. I, mean, I don't know why the hell they coded it this way. I mean, I would have done quartiles, but this is pretty close, it turns out. Okay, 275 is the highest income they had. This is income of parents at birth okay, in 1990. <coughs> and the only other thing we have here is education which once you hold constant for income, doesn't make any difference here. So these are the covariates we have to hold constant for, okay? And we'll just hold constant for them, look at the impact of beauty on the outcome, okay? Outcomes, immense amounts of stuff, okay? Plus, they have some that are objective. This one here, the Woodcock-Johnson Applied Problem Score, anybody ever heard of that? 
Okay. I've found three economics papers that use this. I think they're in de on developing economies. Okay. That's one. We also have the MDI, the Bailey Mental Development Index. You know that one, I'm sure? No? And it's a test which is objective, designed to be applied to very little kids. Okay. Uh, that was used that's from a study of Columbia that did something on that. And then we have the school readiness. We also have a couple of other ones which are teacher rated, it's ASLL. And then at wave eight, they had nothing else other than the full scale IQ test. So what we'll do is we'll take, in each case, ones I have a lot of frequency on, like the Woodcock Johnson, we'll use that for five waves. We'll use the Benny Mental Development for two and three the BK Bracken School Readiness and the Wexler Full Scale. In other words, take the best measure, objective measure I can at each age, unit normalize it, and use that as the variable of interest. Okay? I can't do the same variable period after period, it just ain't there. Are there any measures of non-cognitive sort of skills, personality kind of stuff in these data? Not a heck of a lot early on. And moreover, what they are, they're rated by the mama. I see. Which I don't like at all. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the equation. It's a standard autoregression, some unit normalized score on some objective test against the same thing last period, a bunch of covariates, and then the beauty measure, which is standardized. So the alpha, this is really bad notation. The alpha there is the beta. Sorry to do that. I've never seen that before. The alpha there is the beta of beauty on test score in the short run, because it's an autoregression, right? Looking at well, 10 different waves, T minus one, the first period is that, okay? And we're going to estimate this separately each T for 10 waves, okay? Which we put in an appendix running out of space, I mean, the crucial thing is the first row there, which is each report's an autoregression. This is uh, waves 2 through 6. Here's 7 through 11. The overwhelming majority are positive after controlling for everything. Okay. And I think four out of those that are positive are statistically significant at some level. Okay. Problem is there are not a heck of a lot of observations as you can see by today's standards. What's really cool is, and depressing, this is another paper of my co-authors, that is, look at these on non-Hispanic black. You hold everything else constant, including income, and the non-Hispanic blacks are going to do worse in terms of value added in every period. This is really depressing. Okay? It's much the most important thing in the paper, but it's been done on these data before. The household income, notice, most of them seem to be larger as you move up the income scale. Problem is it's hard to figure out what's going on here because there's so many regressions going on. The samples are small. So let's pool them all over here. First of all, estimating without covariates, we get a coefficient of about 0.10. Okay, that's a short run beta of 0.10. Hold constant for all this stuff. A short run beta of 0.045, long run about uh, 0.08. Okay, but that's a coefficient, not a beta. Remember, the standard deviation is 0.55, so you've got to adjust it. Okay, but there's no question this seems to have an effect holding everything else constant. I can't hold constant. Okay, the beauty seems to affect the value added. Okay, question A. Why do the effects, what's causing the effect to drop from the first three columns to the last three columns? Okay. I don't know how much econometrics people have followed in the last few years. It's really well beyond me. People all know the blinder Oaxaca decomposition, right? Everybody knows that. It is completely antiquated. Never use it. Right? What do you do instead? This wonderful thing of Jonah Gelbox. People know this one? Check it out, okay? It was a paper four years ago in the Journal of Labor Economics. It's now in state. Even an idiot like me can do it, okay? It's basically the problem with the blinder Oaxaca is it depends where you start. 
get two different answers. This does this all at once and gets an answer that's order free. And so we did that and asked the question, how much of the change in the beauty effect comes from these three vectors of variables? Race, ethnicity, parents, education, or income? The answer is the coefficient is getting smaller because of the relationship between race, ethnicity, and beauty ratings, which I showed you already, but it's nice to see this done formally. Okay? So that's what's causing the change, the change here. Next thing is to answer econometrically. I, I did econometrics as my field in grad school 50 some years ago, so I still think it's sort of neat stuff. Is <coughs> what if we had more covariates? How much different would the estimates be? People are familiar with the Altanji, Elder, Tabor stuff. Have you seen the new thing on this by Emily Oster? No. Check this out. You know this. Okay. So very nice. The problem with the Altanji thing is, they ask the question, what if the R square were one? Which is idiotic. I mean, the world doesn't work with an R square of one. I always thought this paper was rather silly, but people know it. What Emily Oster did was say, let's take a bunch of studies and see how much could possibly get the R square up by. Ask the question then, given what we have, given what the existing covariates changed, the crucial variable of interest, which in our case here is the beauty, how much, if a reasonable increase in the R squared, what would the correlation of the unobservables have to be with the crucial X variable? in order to change it to being no longer statistically significant. I think that's a fair summary of the paper, okay? And we did that in all of these. The left out unobservables would have to be more correlated with beauty than the things we observe, which it's very hard to think of things you might have left out that would be that highly correlated. Believe me, this, doesn't, this test doesn't always come out that way. I just tried it on something else, and boy, did it destroy everything. <laughs> But on this thing here, there's no question it works quite, quite well. So those are the basic results on this. Uh, here's the Oster stuff. Delta is the correlation of the left out of the unobservables with the x compared to the observables. It's above 1. It's pretty high. OK, how large is the effect? Solve the difference equations. The beta on the long run effect is about 0.04. Uh, it looks larger, but remember the standard deviation is smaller. So in fact, it's smaller than that. It's about 0.04. Is that big or small? Well, it's smaller than the consensus on the effect of teacher quality, but it's as large as stuff people are writing about like crazy, like disruptive kitties or charter schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it's worth talking about. I would have liked a larger number to make more of a thing about the paper. But there's no question it's there. We tried robustness tests, a disgusting thing that fills up the pages of the QJE every issue. And first of all, get rid of waves 2 and 10, because those wave 1 has a subjective measure, wave 10 does too. It didn't matter very much. So we do it only on 8 t's and t minus 1's. Didn't affect things. The cool thing was, the Wexler, the Woodcock-Johnson has a verbal test also. So instead of using the Woodcock-Johnson applied problems, which is math, do the Woodcock-Johnson verbal. And the estimated effect of beauty is smaller. Okay. Which it turns out, if you look at the education literature, some people tell me, uh, almost everything is smaller on verbal than on math. The teachers don't matter as much on the verbal test scores as they do on the math test scores. I don't know why this should be true, but this is what the literature shows. Okay? So beauty matters more on math than on reading, just as everything else appears to matter more on math. OK, here are these alternative specifications. Ah, maybe it's how well the kids dress that makes them considered good looking. I get this. Every beauty paper I've done, I get this comment. Well, we don't measure this very much in the study, but at waves 10 and 11, they asked the rater to, the, the rater to say, is the kid dressing better than average for somebody his or her age? Okay? So we can do only two autoregressions pooled, 10 compared to 9, 11 compared to 10, and throw in the measures of the kid's dress in addition to the covariates. It raises the beauty effects. 
Okay, they're larger once you throw in the kid's dress. Is this surprising? Who are the kids who are dressing well? You all went to high school. Who were they? Yeah, not so uh, good-looking. They were the no, well, but they were the athletes and the cheerleaders. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> not me and my friends, that's for sure. Okay, <laughs> and so one could argue these are people who are spending their time worrying about their dress, not learning as much each year in class. That's my story. I can't prove it, but it's consistent with that rise in the effect there. Okay, next thing. Uh, I won't scream too much. I got in trouble. I gave this at Columbia two months ago. And I started going on about the endogeneity Taliban. And uh, one of the people there got very angry at me about this. So I won't say that, except having done so I did. Uh, what if the rating is endogenous? Okay. I don't know why the devil you could think that the rating two years ago is somehow endogenous, holding the two years ago test score constant to this year's test score. I mean, it's a really convoluted argument you have to make. But OK, we'll do it. It happens that the four periods of the four stages of this 11-stage process, they also got ratings of the, they took pictures of the moms. They have videos of the moms, which they had rated. OK? So what do you do? You instrument the kid's beauty with the mom's beauty as rated, OK? Is this cleaner? Maybe, unless it's, uh, unless I know you talk about IQ. Is, well, we'll, we'll get to IQ. Speaking of right, but if that is, then, then it's maybe problematic. We'll get to IQ, OK? okay? Anyway, instrument the kid's beauty by the mom's beauty. This is the first column here. Look at that, folks. It's not exactly a strong instrument. But boy, is it significant. The standard errors are clustered, by the way, so there's no problem at all with the standard errors. The mother's beauty is highly correlated with the kid's beauty rating. Okay? Although the R square is only about 0.015. Take the prediction of the kid's beauty and throw it in in place of the kid's beauty in an IV framework, okay? So it's the exact same equation as before, but we're now using the instrumental prediction of the kid's beauty as predicted by his or her mom's beauty, okay? And if you'll notice, the results look, in terms of statistical significance over there, very similar. The effect for all kids is larger than for girls, smaller than for boys. Both the boys and the all are statistically significant. The only problem is, that the coefficients look much, much bigger, right? If you go back to table four over there, here we got on the all 0.045, here we got 0.557. Okay. However, the standard deviation of the instrument is much, much smaller than the standard deviation of the kids' beauty ratings. And in fact, if you take the beta on this, okay, in fact, the beta effect is almost identical to what it was before. Okay? So the instrumental estimates qualitatively give the almost identical estimates to what we got with the OLS. Okay? So this might have taken care of the, the Taliban. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, let's look at. One other thing, we we'll might later on do this, okay? I won't do it now, but I'll worry about your intelligence thing later as best I can. Okay, a totally different data set, an NCDS. I don't know if anybody knows these data. This is one of these British cohort studies where they have every person born in a particular week in the UK. Uh, I think there's 58 cohorts the first. There's a millennium cohort now. I think there have been four of them. And they follow these people over their entire lives. The television show I saw, which now I've seen this, I can't remember what it's called, but some guys followed a bunch of kids from age 7 up to age 63 now. Isn't it, is it called 7 Up? Yeah. yeah. 7 Up, that's what it is, 7 Up. Okay, I haven't seen it, but I read about this. This is the same thing. And they really, they start at birth, but the first serious sets of information are at age 7, in fact, surprisingly enough. Anyway, they follow these people over the whole time. The main thing for this part of the study is they have the kids' birth, ages 7, 11, and 16, and then they've been doing it during adulthood, okay? The beauty measures here, the kids' teacher is asked to rate the kids' beauty. 
And you can imagine we're going to use age 7 rating to look at the change from 7 to 11, and the age 11 beauty to look at the change from 11 to 16 and some outcome, all right? Anyway, so the kid is rated as good looking or attractive, bad looking, unattractive or abnormal feature. There are a few kids, about 2%, who are rated scruffy or dirty, which I just, it's just such a wonderful anglicism, okay? And we throw them out. I mean, I don't know what scruffy or dirty really tells me about their looks. So we're throwing out 2% of the sample. Those who get none of these ratings are considered average looking. Notice the asymmetry. I mean, 60% are rated as good looking, 10% as bad looking, okay? And we don't have a continuous distribution. We have three categories, that's all, okay? Uh, same thing at age 11. And remember, this is longitudinal data. The same kids are in both surveys. Uh, the assessments are it's really bizarre. Uh, at age seven, they have a standardized reading test in the UK called the Southgate test. I never heard of it as a standard. But all the other ratings of math at age seven and both reading and math at age 11 and 16, they devise their own test, okay? That the term in English is, it's a purpose-built test. They, for some reason, they didn't want to use something, I don't know why because you can't compare the kids to much else, okay? So those are the outcomes we're going to look at. Basically, the change in the arithmetic and the math and the reading test from 7 to 11 and from 11 to 16, all these scores standardized, just like before. Okay. We're also going to pool them. So we're going to be pooling the 11, 7 to 11, and the 11 to 16 regressions, do all the standard stuff that we do, okay? We're going to hold constant for social class in the base period. That's social class of the father, which we do. They have some income measures. They aren't very good. And I felt that the social class vector would be more usable. Uh, we also have region where they live. It turns out the average beauty differs across region in the UK, okay, which we showed in another study. People in Scotland and Northern Ireland are uglier than those in Southeast England. I gave that, that paper in the UK once, not in Scotland, and got a lot of very good laughs out of it. <laughs> All right, so here's the basic regression, reading and math without, with covariates, uh, women holding gender constant, okay, in the second column in each case throwing in the covariates, which matters a lot, and you can see that compared to the 30% in the middle, the 60% up top are improving more, right? And the 10% at the bottom are improving less than the 30% in the middle, okay? All right, math, roughly the same. The covariates matter not very much at all. They matter basically because the father's social class matters, okay? The region makes no difference if that goes the other way if you do that decomposition. But notice the results look remarkably like the other, qualitatively in terms of significance, except they are much bigger. You can't do it in terms of standard deviations directly, but we know that the top group comprises 60 percent. So the median person there is at the 70th percentile. If we're a standardized unit normal, compare the median person in the top 60% to the median person in the next 30%, that's a 1.2 standard deviation change. So we can compare this under the assumption that these things would be normal if we could only get people to give specific numbers rather than classify. Is, is that kind of, when you look at the, the um, a wage premium to beauty sort of across these countries, do you see some similar size differences between the UK and the US? It's still smaller elsewhere than in the U.S., even if you do this kind of comparison. I mean, I have a graph looking at this in SD bases. It's still smaller, okay? Again, I think it's because of the greater inequality in earnings here, but I can't prove that. So anyway, the beta coefficients here in the long run between 0.04 up to 0.15. So these are larger. Not huge, but larger than we found for the SECC YP, okay? So those are the basic results in this. We'll do a bunch of robust stuff in a bit. Is it just beauty? Okay. 
So <coughs> beauty is a proxy for intelligence. In other words, our beauty and intelligence correlated. I've seen only one study which purported to look at this directly. It happens a study I used in the first paper had an IQ rating and a beauty rating, and there was no correlation whatsoever. Okay? That's pretty weak evidence, because the IQ rating it only had eight categories. That's not too cool. Uh, one way of getting at this is to get only the last nine waves, do an autoregression. You, even, you couldn't even use an IQ later on, because you could argue that's affected by the kid's looks, which affects the, how well he or she did, which affects the IQ measure. So let's just use the waves starting at age two years, do the autoregressions, pool them, and in every wave include the standardized score that we had for the kid at the first, second wave, age 15 months, okay? Which could not be affected by the subsequent changes. So we're going to put the same autoregression, but we're going to throw in the wave two objective measure of cognition. Okay? Does that get at it? I think that's pretty cute. Okay, somebody complained about this well into the study, and I said, ah, here's a way of getting at it. Okay? And it matters a little bit. You can see what happens to the without covariates, it drops by about 15%, with covariates by about 20%. It's still there, but it's a little bit smaller, okay? But it's not fatal, is it, more? Okay. In the NCDS, all we can do is look at the autoregression from age six, 11 to 16 and throw in the age 7 standardized outcome on each of these tests, reading and maths, okay? And you do that, and this is the coefficient comparing the top 60% to the middle, this is comparing the bottom 10% of the middle. In the reading, this really drops down at about a third. It's still there, it's statistically significant, but the math doesn't make any difference at all. Okay? So I think this is the best we can do on these two data sets, to throw in basically a lag objective measure on period T plus 1 compared to T plus 2 change in the effect. Okay? Any other thoughts on this? I mean, I know we sent this paper out three months ago for refereeing. Some year, I'm now 76, probably by the time I'm 80, it'll get published. So there's really time yet to see what might, any other thoughts? I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> if my career depended upon this, I'd be going crazy, but my career doesn't depend upon anything. <laughs> so it doesn't. I mean, I have no so the question is, is there anything else I could do on this baby? I would welcome all thoughts on this. Okay. All right, that takes care of that. Intervening, this is by the way, you'll like this. My co-author said we should look at intervening factors. That's the term you guys use, right? I'd never heard this before, okay? But that's a sociological term. Uh, I call them other covariates, but it's actually more than that. So it's pretty cool thinking about this. Okay. It turns out in the SECCYD, we have, not, a, not initially, but after, I think, at age first grade, we have information on how the teacher feels about the kid. Okay. And in particular, do you feel in close to the kid, or do you feel in conflict with the kid, which are highly negatively correlated, not surprisingly. Okay. So the question is, throw in these measures, what does that do to the estimated impact of beauty on the kid's change? In other words, is it beauty that's just reflecting the teacher's, causing the teacher to feel in conflict with the kid? Kid's ugly, I fight with them, kid doesn't do very well in school the next year, okay? Doesn't learn much. Or well, inversely, I feel close to the kid because he's so gorgeous, spend a lot of time with him or her, and they improve their scores tremendously. Okay, so over here, we have it without controls, here we have with controls. The second column in each pair of these three columns has the teacher feels close to the student. Are you in the upper half of closeness or lower half? Third has teacher feels in conflict. They go the expected way. Right? Close to the kid, the kid improves more. Fighting with the kid, the kid improves less. But the beauty effects don't change a heck of a lot at all. In other words, these things matter. That they're not related to beauty at all. It's not that the teacher's in conflict with the ugly kid or feeling close to the good-looking kid. 
that's not what's going on here at all. Okay, what else do we have here? We also had in the data set the mom's reports of the kids being bullied. I know, I'm just stupid, I don't know why we did this, but somebody said try bullying and we had the data, what the hell. You do it, it makes no difference at all. Next, we included, included kid fixed effects, which wipes out a lot of variation because a lot of the kids' looks are consistent over time. Uh, the results for the boys just actually are larger than we saw before. For girls, it's mostly wiped out. Most of the effects, just as they are for adult earnings, are for boys, not for girls, just as they are for men rather than women. Yeah, how, how much sort of within kid uh, variation is there? In, about in the a third of the variation in the beauty ratings and the mean beauty rating mm -hmm. is a fixed effect for the kid. Mm -hmm. Two thirds varies from a bit. If you decompose, it's through a decomposition of variance, okay? It's one third, two thirds in the SECYD. And you know, it really is cool. It's, you only have two observations on beauty. It's actually very similar in the NCDS. It's one third fixed, two third just bouncing around. In, in, in both directions. In both, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, if you're rated good looking in the base period, yeah. you're rated better than the average, but there's a lot of variation, even with 10 raters. I think there's a lot of randomness too. So we included that. Next question I've gotten this in every beauty paper, is it beauty or is it self-confidence? I think it's a stupid question in a lot of ways. Because what if it's the case that the beauty makes me self-confident? I mean the ultimate thing is what's going on is my looks that make me self-confident. Okay? So we even have in the SECCYD you have questions at wave 10, that's in sixth grade, about your confidence in your ability in math, your confidence in your ability in English, and your overall optimism. Okay? So, add this, doesn't affect beauty at all. There's almost no correlation of these people's self, these kids' self confidence with their looks. Okay? It just doesn't matter. It affects how well they do in terms of the VAM. That doesn't, it's not related to beauty. It doesn't alter that coefficient at all. Uh, in the NCDS, we have other measures. Let me just go through them over here. We asked the mom when the kid is seven, does the kid have difficulty concentrating? You might think about what your mother would have said at age seven. Does the kid, is the kid upset by new situations? Does the kid fight with other kids? Is the kid bullied at age seven? At age 11, is the kid, I just love this, miserable or tearful, which is a wonderful, sort of very English, or is the kid squirmy or fidgety? You might ask yourself what your mother would have said, as I suggested. I would have gotten a yes on one of these. Any guesses? I won't be offended. The squirming or fidgety, for sure. Oh, yeah, there's no question about that. It's a lifelong fixed effect for people, I think. <laughs> anyway, so we control for all of these in the second column with all the covariates that we had before. And most of them are really nice and significant, and they go the way you expect. But look at the effects on the good looks dummy and the bad looks dummy. They drop them by less than 10%. I mean, these things matter. But again, they're not correlated. So you see why I said at the start, I know all kinds of things that aren't the underlying causes, but I don't know what the underlying cause is. We'll talk about it a little bit more later on. Okay, robustness with other variables. Get rid of minorities, okay? 40% of minorities. Do non-Hispanic whites. The effects are slightly smaller for the, minor for the majority, slightly larger for minorities but not much. The beauty effects are there for both. Uh, use the average beauty, in other words, average over all the periods. Doesn't matter, obviously. That's clearly not going to matter. Okay? That suggests that though, that the variation from period to period is random. Parental stress. Maybe if the parent is stressed, the kid's not going to learn as much, and the parent may be stressed because the kid's ugly. Okay? That's stressful or not. Okay? Uh, it turns out that the parental stress measures, which is self-reported, in fact, are negatively related to the change in the kids' performance on these cognitive measures. 
but they're absolutely unrelated to beauty. It's not that the ugly kid is making me stressed, it's apparent. Okay? That's in the SECCYD. NCDS, they have birth order. We don't have that in the SECCYD. No question, the higher order births do worse, okay, in terms of the change from one period to the next. If you're a first child in your family, this should make you feel pretty good. Uh, but this is absolutely unrelated to the beauty rating by the teacher. It just doesn't matter. BMI, every beauty paper we've done, I'm asked about is it beauty or is it weight? It's a stupid question, okay? <laughs> because in fact, if you look at, there have been a couple of studies, one just wonderful one, had a bunch of raters rate the beauty of people looking front and back, and then other raters, since the people were naked, tried to guess their BMI and look at the correlations of them. These are adults, it's Austria. And there's no correlation at all. In fact, if you throw in the BMI, it does affect the score change, but it has no impact on beauty because this isn't correlated with it. Okay? We even have teacher experience in the NCDS. Overall, it doesn't matter, but the very new teachers, the kids do worse. Is not, that's a pretty well-known fact, but no relation to beauty, which is not surprising. Okay? There are all kinds of little worries about the data set, which I won't go into, that's full of footnotes, but we have tried everything. Any other thoughts? I mean, I'm going to beat on these data, though it's really a nuisance because they're housed in a private server, which is a damn nuisance to use, as those of you who've done it know. But I'm happy to beat on them some more, but I just don't think anything else that we have is going to make a difference on the beauty effects. All right. Nobody here is old enough, I don't think, to remember triangular models. If you've ever heard of this, this was hot stuff in econometrics in the 60s. Okay? The idea being that imagine a system of equations where in the first equation we have one endogenous variable over there, S, see the score, Second equation, we have another outcome which is affected by other variables and the first endogenous variable. Another equation here with another y variable affected by the first y variable and the second y variable. Notice it's a triangular model in the three endogenous variables. Okay? The first equation is the one we've been estimating all along. Score at a particular time in childhood is a function of score, some lag period, beauty, some lag period, a bunch of controls. You've seen that ad nauseum today. Second equation, educational attainment as a function of the score as a kid, beauty as a kid, some controls here. Third equation is the utterly standard earnings equation, log earnings if you want, as a function of educational attainment, beauty as a kid, that's been done before. This, this, and a bunch of controls. And also the score as a kid. The idea being here that part of the reason a person might do better in the labor market is not just that he's better looking, not just he's got more education per se, but rather his additional education is a result of his scores being higher, which are higher because the teacher or whatever favored him or her because he was better looking. So the final equation here gives you an indirect effect of beauty from that second equation on the score, which itself affects earnings and itself affected education as well. So that's the idea here. The novelty in this model is the effect on education because beauty of good-looking kids do better on scores and get more education. Okay, that's what we're going to try to do here. Okay? Uh, with the SECCYD, you can't do this. They don't observe them as adults earning anything. But you can take some other people's estimates of the impact of different things on earnings. A couple of papers by Chetty and company. Chetty, uh, Jonah Rockwath, and somebody else who I can't remember. I always forget his name. And you can use those to simulate the effect of the impact of beauty on score, score on education, education on earnings. And you get that about an extra one and a half percent of effective looks on earnings compared to the direct effect of seven percent per SD. Okay? That's not too cool, 
But with the NCDS, you can actually estimate the model. Okay? And you can show that under reasonable assumptions, you can do this by GLS, and it's nicely identified. And again, nobody sees this anymore. This was hot stuff. I had to learn this in the 60s, take me kind of metrics in 66 and 67. But it's a neat idea. I mean, it's identification of the old-fashioned kind. Okay. And here are the equations. The first two are the same things we had before, except we're looking at age 16 compared to age 7. So that the beauty rating at age 7 is clearly well before the outcome we measure. The holding constant, age 7 scores in each. Looking at the effect, notice it looks very similar to what before, right? Nice and significant. Positive for the good lookers. Really bad for the ugly kids. Okay? And then the cool thing is, years of schooling as, an effect, as affected by the scores. In other words, the fact the scores are higher, you get more schooling, right? But why are the scores higher? In part because you were better looking as a kid. So the causation here is going from this through scores, scores to education, up there, and then education to wages over here. Okay? And so the question to ask is, we have a beauty directly in the, in the, in the wage equation. It's not very big at all. But there's an additional effect through, uh, through educational attainment because of the beauty as a kid. Okay? And in fact, you can decompose this, okay? and you find that in fact, most of the effect of the beauty is on earnings is indirect through the test score thing rather than direct. Direct there is quite, quite small. But it's a little bit larger than I was hoping for. But there's no question there's an effect. It just happens to be mostly indirect. OK, so here we decompose it. That's, I've talked about that. OK, let's talk about this. This is, I think, the most important part of all this. Those of you who do labor, either sociology or economics, we measure immense numbers of discriminatory effects, right? This is just de rigueur. And let's think about what's going on. This is a summary up there, blah, 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 blah. question is, what's going on? What are the welfare impacts of this? Okay. Is this a good thing that I think we've established that the better looking kids do better in school, consistently improving faster and faster than the uglies? Okay. And pardon the language. What does this mean? Is it a good thing? What is the welfare effect? Now try to think about this. Is it productive? Or are we just putting the good kids ahead of the ugly, the good looking kids ahead of the ugly kids in the queue? Well, if we are, let's assume first of all that the teacher or whoever helps kids spends no less time with the bad lookers. Okay? and just spends more time, helps out the good lookers more. And the teacher is happy doing that. Is that good? What are the welfare effects? Well, some sense is yes. On the other hand, is that the best use of the teacher's time? I would say no. The teacher should be spending, if they want to spend more time, should allocate his or her time to the kid with whom the time would add the effects the most, right? Where the value added is greater. So even if the teachers are not hurting the bad-looking kids at all, this still is not the optimum. Make sense? We don't see this kind of discussion ever, I don't think, in the literature, do we? Do you know of any of this? What the welfare effects of discrimination are? Joe, have you seen anything on this, or we just don't talk about it? I mean, not measurement. That's really hard. There were attempts in the 60s to measure the effect on GDP of racial discrimination. It's a public finance question. Basically, discrimination is a wedge in affecting prices. And how much is that wedge? What's the welfare cost? What's the triangle of that? This goes back a long way. I'm sorry for being old. But uh, we should be answering these questions. If, on the other hand, there's no more time spent to just take away from the bad lookers and put toward the good lookers, this is doubly bad. 
is we're hurting some people, probably helping some other, but the total certainly has got to be going down, okay, as well as being discriminatory. So, the final question is, are we discriminating against the ugly, or are we favoring the good-looking? Something else we don't look at in the literature very much at all, on, on beauty or on any other characteristic that you might view as being discriminated against. Anyway, that's, the, that's the, one of the fastest talks I've ever done on this, by the way. So that's really all I have. I won't even summarize I've beaten you over the head with the results umpteen um times already, I think. Questions, suggestions, anything else? Joe said non-cognitive, okay? Yeah, what, what, do we, what, what do we know about sort of peer group formation among young kids of heterogeneous beauty? Uh, well, we do know. Well, we were in high school. Come on. No, no, I get it. I, 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 I'm thinking particularly sort of age seven and younger. We don't have very much at age seven. We have a little bit of peer information at age 11. Mm -hmm. Okay. But nothing before then. Okay. Uh, no, we have the bullying. Post-puberty, post -puberty, no. clearly. Not okay. Well, no. We have the bullying stuff as rated by mom. Whether that's peer group stuff, it might be marginally reflective of peer group relationships. But beyond that, no. Okay. I mean, I, we worry about this, and my co-authors look at the stuff. Question? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't think it. I think these are bigger picture questions. I'm wondering, that's, like, is there a specific developmental age where beauty matters more in the younger ages, like for cognitive? or, or non-cognitive impacts. And then I'm wondering, I know you said a lot of the variation over time is mostly kind of random, but I'm thinking about it's one third, you have one, two thirds random. Yeah. like where you start off, oh, you're such a cute kid, and then you like decline <laughs> over time. And then the pure regression the mean. Conversely, right? Like I'm just wondering, like those trajectories. Like well, but of course, if you're rated high in the first periods and some of it's random, you're going to be in the cosmic sure. regression of the mean. Uh, Make a note of that one. I don't think it'll matter for the results, really. I think the question of at what age, the problem is we do it separately by age, as you saw. The problem is that things bounce around. The sample is so small, I wouldn't want to say anything about the trend. I actually did try a trend at one point when I pulled it, and there wasn't much there. But again, because the samples of each age are pretty small, I don't think it says a heck of a lot. Yeah, I think I'm just thinking of like ad more adult outcomes and is the trajectory of your beauty maybe matter just as much as being like beautiful per se in one, any one time period. Again, I, only one study I've ever seen, part of our first study, had beauty at three different times, two years apart. That's not much of a help. The ad health has beauty at four periods. But again, even there, you're not going up very high in age, right? And you're 25. starting in the teens. You're starting in yeah, teens, you're going up to age eight, to age by 25. So that doesn't help either. No, it's not been done. The new wave is coming out. You'll at least get in the 30s. OK. And is it really? I didn't yep. know that. Yep. OK. Well, somebody will do that, not me. I, mean, I, I promised, <laughs> I published seven papers on beauty. The first one was the AER. Next one, Journal of Labor Economics. And they went down, and my <laughs> wife said, you got to stop doing this, OK? Why don't you write a book? So I wrote the book, and then we did a paper on the sat and happiness, which is published pretty well, European Economic Review. And then we started talking about this, which I think is, other than the first one, the best thing I've done on beauty in terms of being novel. But I promise no more beauty. <laughs> yeah? Have you thought about, or is there any people out there thinking about using braces as a Instrument. There's a paper on that, actually. We don't have braces, but there's a paper on braces I saw a couple of years ago. That's just a structure and also... No, just pure braces. That's all. Whether the kid's wearing braces, okay? There's something on... I think it was actually a teenagers and adults looking at long-term effects on earnings, okay? But, I mean, it's a pretty small data set, so you're not going to find much on that. And again, for our stuff, I mean, when the kids start wearing braces, 11, 12, 13, it's only one wave in our stuff. That ain't going to matter. I think, I think of my grandchildren wearing braces. It's about 11 or 12. So I was 12 when I had them on. One more problem with being in middle school. <laughs> <laughs> I don't enough of any of them. 
Other suggestions, worries, comments? Darn it, I mean. If, if they are rated by kids, uh, <coughs> do you think the ratings are similar? If, well, they're rated by kids. Now, now these people are rated by, these, these people are born in 1990. They were rated in the 2013, 14, 15 by other, by college students yeah. who are almost the same cohort. Yeah. Now, again, would the ratings have been different at age five if we had five-year-olds doing the ratings? That's right. But at least we, but, 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 but at least we had people of the same cohort doing the ratings. I mean, for example, one of the studies, the Wisconsin study, had kids who graduated high school in 58, and they had them rated by people in 2001 or two who were roughly the same age. I mean, that seems the best we can do. We're not going to have little kids rating other little kids. The best things I can remember what it looks like. You see, I have my wedding picture. I had my door at Texas a few years ago, and somebody said, God, you were a nerd. I said, no, that's what people looked like then. I was no more nerdy than anybody else. And it takes somebody of the same cohort to rate your beauty as a young person or now. So I, no, we didn't have it. Uh, you couldn't do it. But at least we had the right cohorts ready in the same cohort. That's the best we could do. Other thoughts, worries? Yes, sir. Do you know anything about whether um, good-looking people uh, tend to study more or spend more time studying? <laughs> No, we sure don't. I mean, this is what, you know, what I really would like, of course, is time use, since I spend half my life on these days. What are these kids doing in school with their time? And to observe the teachers interacting with them, rather than just, does the teacher like the kid or not? No, we have nothing on that. That's what you really want, because that's going to get the causation, the deep down causation, not the X affecting the Y, but the, the why of what's going on rather than the what. But we don't have that. Other questions, thoughts, worries? <coughs> okay, thank you all very much for coming. Uh -huh.